Hey everybody, welcome back to I Didn't Sign Up For This. I can't believe I'm on episode 6 already, but I would just want to thank everybody for hanging around and um, sticking with it and seeing what I have to say about being a special needs parent. I'm hoping sometime in the future to expand a little bit beyond just the scope of special needs parenting. Um, because after a while, you know, I'm probably going to run out of stuff to say. Also, you know, there's other things I can talk about too, and we'll see where that leads us. But for right now, we're just going to stick with this because, you know, thanks to you lovely humans out there, I have topics for eight more episodes that I can just go with at any time. And I don't even have to think about it. I can just do it. So I think that's going to be good. Let's, uh, let's just refresh and talk about the Facebook page, which again is at facebook.com slash IDSUFT podcast. And from there, you can also join the group that I've started for us all to talk about whatever. Um, the, the page is more for me to post information and, you know, the, hey, we're live kind of things, stuff like that. The group is more for us to talk and, um, to get, to get our stories out, to share experiences, to share what you all think about what we're talking about, you know, that kind of thing. So, Get involved, uh, share your story, share your thoughts, share your ideas, you know, whatever you want to talk about, that group is there for you. So I encourage you to start a conversation or join a conversation. There really isn't any wrong, as long as you're being kind and polite, which I always insist upon, um, we're all good. So, uh, yeah, and then, um, of course, all the regular iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher. I've got a post pinned at the top of the podcast page, facebook.com slash IDSUFT podcast. There's a post pinned there that shows, um, that gives you a link to all the different podcast, um, ugh, homes iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music, um, and then the, also a link to the RSS feed. So if, you, again, if you have a favorite podcast app, uh, you're already, like I am, a podcast connoisseur. <laughs> okay, y'all, just, just a heads up. I'm going on like a month of two to three hour chunks of sleep at a time. So I don't get more than two to three hours of sleep in a sitting before someone wakes me up or I wake myself up. So if I'm a little giddy today, that'll be why. I promise I'm not drunk. I'm just really tired. So I can't even remember what I was talking about. Oh, there's an RSS feed. Um, and whatever your favorite podcast app is, you just plug it right in there. And it'll come up and you subscribe and then you'll automatically get all the new ones when they come out. So that's that. The podcast is also on Instagram and Twitter and they both have the same handle, which is IDSUFT podcast. Isn't that convenient that it's all the same thing? And if you just type that in pretty much anywhere, something will come up. So yeah, follow, follow us on Instagram, follow us on Twitter, join us on Facebook, you know, just get involved and maybe someday we'll have merch and, you know, all sorts of cool things, t-shirts and mugs and stickers and stuff. Who knows? If you have questions or topic ideas or stuff and you maybe aren't a social media person, drop me an email at uh, Christy at idsuftpodcast.com. I'd love to read what you have to say. I'd love to get to know you. This episode, um, I kind of kind of threw my hook out there, threw my line out, cast my net on my Facebook page, and asked people for some more ideas. And the lovely, lovely Spencer 
suggested this idea. And since I already had like a billion and six, since I already had like a billion and six examples of this particular topic, I decided to go with that because it would, you know, I could just use what I already had. So today we're going to talk about being a special needs parent and what it's like to be in public with your child. Um, this is a really, this can be a really difficult topic for uh, parents of kids with any sort of different need because the world in general, you know, uh, people can be assholes. Let's just put it frankly. People can be assholes. And if anything they see is not the way they think it should be, you you get your side eye, you get your your evil eye, you get your nasty comments, all that kind of stuff. So it can be really, really difficult to take the plunge and get out there with our kids. You know, if you're a parent, if you're a parent of any kind of kid, you really can dread the inevitable group outing. Um, when we all need to go somewhere, like to the store or to, I don't know, who knows, just somewhere basic like the store. And you're concerned how your kids are going to behave or if one of them is going to freak out about not getting to get something or whatever. Are are the incessant demands going to make you lose it? Um, is Bobby going to pick on Cindy and start an over the cart war over something stupid? Are you going to make it through the checkout without Timmy screaming for gum? These are all things that we all face, no matter what kind of parent you are. We've all been there. There's no way to ensure that everybody's going to behave long enough to finish the errand you need to finish. And God forbid a stranger throws you the bad parenting evil eye in the soup aisle. But for the most part, parents of everyone, well, Parents of everyone except toddlers can count on a certain level of decorum with your kids, or at the very least, you can threaten them realistically enough that you'll get through with minimal collateral damage. But there are outings that can be fun for the whole family. The museum, the aquarium, the zoo, the park, where there's something to interest everyone. And in general, everybody has a good time, and the fighting if there is any, is minimal and easily handled. However, this scenario can be so different for those of us who have children who are different. In fact, it can be so difficult, so stressful, soul-crushing, that many of us choose to figure out any way possible not to involve those children in these activities. Not because they we don't think they might enjoy it or we want to keep them insulated or anything, but because the planning and the implementation of any public outing, it can be something that the Queen of England's event planners would balk at. Here's the thing. We know our kids. We know what they can and can't handle and most of the triggers that might set them off. We know when the timer is running down fast and we need to hightail it out of here now. We can get a feeling if today isn't the day. We mostly know even what environments we have to absolutely avoid altogether because the odds are never in our favor. And these are just the kids who aren't medically fragile or don't have some sort of equipment that has to travel with them wherever they go. Add to the first point of possible biblical meltdowns, the requirement of intubation or feeding tubes or only having so much battery time before your child has to be plugged in, plus maneuvering a wheelchair the size of a smart car. While you know the benefit of being out in public and going places to experience and see things, the actual doing of it is incredibly limiting. Remember how I talked last week about the fact that sometimes, as the parents of these people, we cannot choose what's optimal or what's favorable, or what's enlightening. We have to choose sometimes what's easy. Because you know what? Our lives are freaking complicated. 
For every child that has a special need, there's a laundry list of boxes that have to be ticked, items that can't be forgotten, issues that have to be handled or that we have to be prepared to handle in order to be out in the world like the rest of you. Now, I know very little about parenting a child who's medically fragile or who is wheelchair bound. Henry has had many students like this in his classes over the years, but while I've seen it, I don't know the lengths to which parents have to go to engage their children in anything. I do know it's much more than I have to deal with, and I honor their work. The first part, the meltdown aspect, that's something I've dealt with since my eldest child was very small. Before we had any idea that he had issues, we were acutely aware of the risks of taking him out in public. Unfortunately, I, at that time, I didn't have any idea what was going on. And I just thought I was doing something wrong. And that made him unable to behave like the quote unquote, other children, which what, what, what does that even mean? To behave like the other children. Ugh. Now, when he was really young, like say three to six, he had so much trouble with this. The episodes of meltdowns in stores or uh, difficulty in being with other kids, the, there were many, many difficult episodes. They usually went like this. We would stop at Target to pick up a few things. And then for some reason... The eldest would have one of his epic meltdowns. In in one particular situation I can remember, it was because I was not moving the cart in the direction he wanted it to go. So he's like falling to the floor, screaming very loudly, kicking. I would have to stop in the middle of the juice aisle and physically restrain him, like hold him on my lap and hold him tight. Now picture a very large, because I'm a large woman, a large grown woman sitting on the floor of Target, surrounded by juicy juice and snack packs of goldfish, holding a kicking, screaming four-year-old. And I'm rocking him back and forth, and I'm going, shh, you need to calm down. Shh, mommy loves you. Shh calm down. It's okay. Meanwhile, Henry's up in the cart and he's trying to turn around and see what's happening and he's starting to cry. So now there's two crying children. Mommy's on the floor. Random shoppers are trying not to stare and some are more successful than others. I used to think I should make myself up like little business cards that said something like, my kid has autism. I'm not beating him up. Please mind your own business. Because, you know, to be fair, random onlookers, they don't know what's going on. Uh, it, the kid could be freaking out about having a toy or he could be having a seizure. They don't know. Another time I can remember was, oh, I made the epic mistake of trying to have him do t-ball at the park district. He was really excited about it. And so I was excited that he was going to get to try this. Until we got there. There were a dozen little three or four year old kids all sitting nicely on the grass, holding their mitts and listening to the coach, except for mine. He was running wildly around, chasing birds, pulling up grass and throwing it in the air, yelling, I don't want to, and basically refusing to participate. He's crawling around on all fours like a wolverine. He ran up to the coach and literally pulled his leg hair. I, I didn't know what was wrong with him. All I could think is, why is it my child who can't participate in anything ever? Why is it my kid who other parents look at and they're revulsed by him? I mean, you know, come on, it's T-ball for crying out loud. It's every little boy's dream, right? So after about 20 minutes of this, um, I tried, I was trying to convince him to join the other kids. And I finally did. They ran around the bases a couple times and they learned how to field a grounder and they started to learn how to throw. Eldest boy tossed his ball at the coach, threw his mitt down in the dirt and marched away in tears. You know, it was a never-ending exercise in futility. He would want to do something, 
But then he would find that he couldn't, no matter how hard he tried. I would get terribly frustrated with the wasted money and time. Um, I, I was trying to give him fun things to do. So it's not just sitting in the house, but it was like Sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill only to have it roll back down and crush you. But you don't want to give up and just hermit up in your house. So we would try disorganized activity. <laughs> Rather than joining a team, we'd go to the zoo or the aquarium or the museum. But, you know, even that rarely worked out. In fact, one time when we went to the aquarium, as all, it always was, it was an exercise in my patience as the eldest boy had problems with anyone wanting to see anything he wasn't interested in. Only sharks and octopuses and squids, mom. And he would start to freak out if anybody wanted to take a moment and see, I don't know, fish. But we had made it through without having to leave early. So that was a bonus. We even went to the gift shop and I think everybody got something. So then we were near the front door or the front entrance, really, where I had to, uh, I had to get Henry's coat on and get him situated in the stroller before we headed over to the, headed? Before we went over to the elevators to um, go down to the handicapped entrance. In the blink of an eye, Eldest boy ran over to the revolving doors, not more than 15 feet away from us. And as I opened my mouth and began to tell him, no, don't get in there. Come back here now. He somehow, and I still don't, I can't tell you how it happened. He got his head caught in the revolve. <sighs> I was, I screamed as I just was seeing his head pop off like a champagne cork. And thank God someone got there to stop the revolve. Um, there was no one else in the door at the time, so nobody was pushing it. And th there was no one trapped by him. And thankfully his head didn't pop off. Somehow the, um, they, they got maintenance to come and push the door back the other way. I don't know how they did it, but they were able to get his head out. And the whole time that little boy is like freaking out because he realized what almost happened to him. Thankfully, my husband was with us on that trip. So he could be over there helping and trying to keep the boy calm while they worked it out. So I could stay with Henry and my daughter, who was aghast and attempt to keep my own freak out under 11 but that's always the way it went. We try a fun outing somewhere to get out of the house and see the world and maybe learn something. The eldest boy would get a bee in his bonnet about something. And I didn't understand what it was. And what started out as something nice to do together turned into fighting and, and a happiness for everyone. My daughter always got her hopes up that she'd actually get to do something for a change. And then in her mind... Eldest would ruin it by melting down until mom couldn't take it anymore and we'd have to leave. So she'd get bitter and angry because it was unfair. But, you know, literally after years of trying, I gave up. I couldn't fight with him. I couldn't tolerate the feeling that everyone around me was annoyed that I would bring that brat out into the world. Even simple things with a child who's different can cause... <sighs> Major anxiety is the only way I can think to put it. Um, I can recall a trip to the Children's Museum when Henry was seven. Now he was old enough to participate in stuff and explore it like the other kids. Uh, but, you know, once again, I noticed too many people were just looking at Henry even before he did anything to attract attention. Like they were surprised at his existence and that he would be at a museum. I get it. I get that Henry looks different. And while at seven, he probably looked and acted three. Um, he might act a little differently than they thought. But I mean, it's not like he looked like he was 10 and acted like he was two. But haven't most adults at least seen a person with Down syndrome before? Children, I can forgive. This may be something new that they haven't seen before. But come on, guys, adults, let's figure it out. So we're at this children's museum and 
there was a big water area. I mean, it was, it was kind of like if you had a lazy river and, and it was, you know, small, like Barbie doll sized, but moved up on stilts. So it's at the level of a child's playing. That's what it was. And there's all these cool different, like, um, water toys and, you know, buckets and little things you could, uh, plastic pieces you could put together and have it be like, um, a, a, a funnel or a windmill or, you know, watching how water works in different ways and makes things move. So his interpretation of what to do in the water is very different from the other kids though. And it makes it difficult for him to participate like everyone else. They're all putting pipes together to divert water and doing experimenty things. He just started slapping the water like a, the tail of a whale. And everyone around him got soaked. He wanted to grab all the toys and whip them. So I tried to put the kibosh on that. Not coincidentally, I noticed that people had started moving away from us because who wants to get soaked? When he picked up one of these big sand, big sand and water toys, that's almost like a tower. You pour the water in the top and it goes down and the, the flaps change and the gears move and it runs through it. I had, to, he picked one of those up and, and he was going to throw it. And so that was when I had to end the fun and strap him back in the stroller. And that's kind of the program for Henry. We had to end the fun and strap him back in the stroller. <laughs> at least back in the day. Now we just have to try to redirect him enough to get him the hell out of there. Oh, one digression. On that trip, I got a peek at how the eldest boy's differences would someday play out. We went up to the third floor where there was a theatrical section with a puppet theater and even like a little um, theater platform area with dress up clothes and stuff. Um, eldest boy found a clownfish puppet and he set up shop behind a lemonade stand like Lucy has in Charlie Brown psychiatry, five cents. And he started hawking insurance. Literally. He's making his puppet say, insurance, get your insurance here. <laughs> Which, what? Is there any kid in the history of ever that's ever done a puppet show about insurance? Uh, that was hysterical to me. So back in 2010, on my blog, I had originally posted about that trip to the Children's Museum and how I was like really hyper aware of people's reaction to Henry and the way he interacted with the environment. Before then, he was just this cute little squish who stayed in a stroller because he couldn't really, you know, walk too well and, you know, he didn't interact too much. So this was one of the first times we had gone to a place like this where he got out and was participating. It's one thing to have a cute little quote unquote different child who sits in a stroller and doesn't do anything. It's quite another to have that same child who gets out and invades your space. I suggested that maybe on my blog post that maybe I was being too sensitive and commenters thought that maybe it was more that they were learning from him or they were just interested because they didn't have much experience with people with down syndrome. You know, I took those comments to heart and I admitted it was wholly possible and maybe I'm just paranoid. About two weeks later, I stumbled on a drama in an, a mommy autism blogger community that, you know, it really brought it all home for me. It fully expressed what I, as the parent of three children with special needs, feel that others are actually feeling as they watch us in the world. There was one blogger who was not the parent of a child with special needs. She wrote what she thought was a humorous post about a poorly parented child she encountered in the library. She since she uh, later removed the post and apologized after some mom bloggers of autistic children came in to say that it sounded like the child wasn't naughty, but that she was on the spectrum. 
And this, my friends, is what I'm talking about. This is what lies behind many of the looks and sniffs and stares and the slight moving away that we parents of special needs experience. To be honest, if you have a child like Henry, who has a noticeable delay like Down syndrome, you get less of it. I believe because people see your child with Down syndrome and they think, well, that child couldn't do any better. It's still insulting, but at least they're not quietly judging us. Parents of children on the autism spectrum, however, don't have that benefit of the doubt. Because these children don't look disabled, onlookers assume the child is a brat or spoiled or poorly parented or just needs a good smack when in actuality, they might be doing the best they can, literally. And because I have children who fall into both categories, noticeable delays and unnoticeable delays, I have experienced both. I have experienced the people who excuse everything Henry does because they can see that he has an issue. But When my older son was the same age and did the same things, there was no understanding. There was no grace. It was the sniffs and the stares and the pulling their kids away because there was either something wrong with that kid or with me. Because why would this seemingly normal child behave like such a little asshole? Well, because he's autistic. That's why. I guess my biggest point is that we all need to stop judging. The original blogger had no idea what she was witnessing, but she went ahead and made a judgment about it and mocked it openly. Even after being enlightened about what she might have actually seen, she didn't apologize. She continued to offer advice on how to better handle a child about whom she knew nothing. A child who, if she was autistic had been worked with and therapized and had all sorts of goals she was working towards, which it seemed to be really pretty obvious because she kept repeating to her parent, I'm being patient, aren't I? And it seems, so it seems like patience was something she'd been working on very hard, but because it didn't jibe with the original blogger's definition of patience, she said she wasn't patient at all. So this is the attitude I'm referring to. People like this who make us moms of special needs kids feel like we can't leave the house or like we have to apologize to everyone we come in contact for behavior that's unusual. And that's what I do so much of. Or apologize simply for the fact that our children exist in the world and we had the audacity to bring them where they would have to see them. You might think I'm being overly sensitive or paranoid, But here is proof of the attitude that has been out there judging my three boys, out there saying that I'm a bad parent because his behavior is unusual or even displeasing in public, and subtly passing on their ignorance, their prejudice, and their judgmental attitude onto their children, who hear them talking about these quote-unquote annoying children they encountered, and who watch their parent completely miss out on an opportunity to teach about differences or acceptance or grace or inclusion. I mean, they, they'd probably be more comfortable if we just kept our naughty, naughty children behind closed doors where they didn't have to see it. That would solve everything, wouldn't it? When I read the post I'm talking about, and again, this is back in 2010, I had to comment because I can never keep my mouth shut. I wrote this. As the mother of one son with Asperger's syndrome and another with Down syndrome and autism and a third who's showing signs of sensory processing issues, I would like to say I'm shocked, but I'm not. I spend most of every day apologizing for the existence of my children, for the inability to behave in a way that meets the expectations of strangers, for making others uncomfortable and for just walking into the room and forcing strangers to admit that my children exist. But you know what chaps my hide the most? The fact that these people who have no experience with children who have delays or problems or struggles or just a different way of interacting with the world have the audacity 
to tell us what we're doing wrong. Mostly behind our backs. I will not hurl stones at this particular example, but to all those quote unquote better parent than yous out there, I say this, until you've walked one day in my shoes, shut up. Keep your thoughts to yourself. And especially if you call yourself a Christian, which unfortunately I see a lot of, have a little grace. Realize and understand that you have absolutely no idea what this caregiver is dealing with. Just because you have perfect children who have had no issues learning patience, manners, and all that, doesn't mean that we are not doing our exhaustive best to teach the same to our children. Again, I wrote this in 2010. We've been trying to teach our six-year-old with Down syndrome to stop throwing, hitting, and scratching for three years. And we are consistent, utterly consistent. But what takes you a month or two to teach your child has taken over three years for us. And may I step back and say that at this time, we have been trying to teach our child this for nine years. And remember this, just because a child's issues aren't as obvious. Oh, I'm sorry. This is back to what I wrote. Just because a child's issues aren't as obvious as my child's Down syndrome doesn't mean they're not as real, just as difficult, and just as frustrating for the parent and the child. So perhaps if... Perhaps instead of chanting some ridiculous mantra to yourself as you attempt to ignore what you see as bad parenting, you can watch as that parent attempts to work within that child's parameters to avoid a meltdown. Perhaps you can instead assume that this child and this parent are doing the very best they can. And if you're very, very selfish... You can thank your lucky stars that you don't have to deal with any of this because you and your child are perfect. End quote. So, you know, it's hard for everyone. I know that. Believe me, we had, quote unquote, in public issues with my daughter, too, and she is totally typical. But it's very different when the child is different. What might measure as a 10 to you in bad behavior might only register as a three to us because to us, a 10 involves physical injury or losing a clump of our hair or an innocent bystander getting hurt. It's not about, quote unquote, oh, we've got it so much worse than you. It's not a competition in terms of what we have to deal with. We accept what we have. We work our asses off to not only give our children what they need, but also to try to incorporate the whole in the world thing, giving them experiences, going places, seeing things that neurotypical kids get to do, but also to give the world a chance to see our kids, accept our kids, learn about our kids, so that when we do risk going out there, and more importantly, when they grow up and have to live in the world, we can be met with less side eye and more smiles. One more example. The school my eldest now attends, um, it's a high school, and they started something back in the 2014-15 school year that does what I'm talking about. Their theater department every year does a theater for young audiences show that's geared to children. The second year they did it, I suggested doing a school day performance for the district's life skills students. Since Henry was in that program, I knew they took community trips anyway, and they're always looking for something to do other than going to the park or going to Walmart. So after a bit of administrative cajoling, we got the superintendent to agree to it, and we started it. That first year, this always makes me cry. (laughs) God, I'm going to be, I'm the, the crying podcast. This always gets me every year because it's so important. That first year, I watched students from every corner of ability walk, ride, get pushed into the school's auditorium. Some were in wheelchairs and they had to sit near the front where they could get plugged in, literally plugged into an outlet. 
Some were unable to control vocalizations and movement, and they would stim and vocalize almost constantly. Some had to be near an aisle so they could get up and have a motor break if they needed it. One was blind. Many had hearing issues. But the lights went down, and Charlotte's Web was performed for them. And it was magic. An auditorium filled with children who would never be able to see a live theater performance if it wasn't for this, who watched silent and still as our kids portrayed animals for them and danced and oinked and quacked. These kids were able to focus on the stage. They saw something that they'd never known was a thing before. Live people performing a story for them right in front of their eyes with lighting effects and sound and costumes and makeup. They were transfixed. And when it was over and they left the auditorium and the actors were standing there in their costumes and makeup to say goodbye, the smiles and the happiness, it was, it was palpable. It was tangible. You could touch it. You see, the school made an effort to meet these kids hmm, right where they are. They didn't require them to be or do anything more than they could do. They gave the kids an experience they simply couldn't have anywhere else. They showed them something they didn't know existed before. They didn't just entertain them, but maybe they showed them that this is something that they could do if they're interested. This year was the fifth year we've done it. Every year, hmm, gosh, I'm just, I can't hold back the tears. Every year, it's my favorite day. I am continually moved and transformed by both the children who enter the auditorium and by the teenagers and staff who make it happen. I like to think that everyone is transformed by this event. When you can see how the world and experiences can affect people who don't have access to these experiences every day, it can change your life. When the world can accept more of us bringing our kids out, helping provide opportunities and experiences for our children to be part of the world, then we can feel more confident bringing them into it and sharing them with you. I get so optimistic when I see places where people are doing this, like providing dance classes and theater companies and stuff like that for people with different needs. Unfortunately, none of those will work for my son or kids like my son, because it still requires a certain level of being able to listen and follow directions that he doesn't have. And, you know, the no hitting and throwing thing. Eh. But I'm still optimistic because change is happening. And the more of these opportunities that they have, that there are for higher functioning people, and the more successful that they are, the more chance that we might see opportunities start for those who are lower functioning, like my Henry. Because because even if our kids can't talk or follow directions, or can't understand simple instructions, they still deserve to be a part of our world. So that's just a part of how I deal with my children out in the world. Now, thankfully, my eldest son, around third to fourth grade, he started maturing to a point where he could better manage his Asperger's. We had found him the help that he needed And while there are, of course, still parts of him where it's pretty evident, for the most part, he is just the same as every other kid he goes to high school with. He has friends. He he's involved in theater, which, my God, we never thought that when he was like four years old. But (sighs) there are still these issues for Henry. Every day there are these issues We don't take him out to restaurants, which means we don't go out to eat as a family. We are very careful where we take him because even one-on-one, if he's got somebody right there on him, even then, 
bad things can happen. So we're, it's, it's, the world is difficult when you have a child like Henry. I, I have people who say, oh, just, you come and you just bring him. See, I can't do that. Because if he's there, I'm with him. I'm not focused on anything else but him to make sure, first and foremost, that nobody gets hurt, that nothing gets broken. I can't bring him to your house. You have things there that will break. (laughs) First and foremost, to make sure nobody gets hurt, nothing gets broken. Third, and only to a certain extent, that he enjoys himself. That he's occupied and not bored. My enjoyment of a thing isn't even, doesn't even in, in, get involved in any way. If he's there, I'm not there. If that makes sense. And that's the way it is for a lot of us. So you may wonder why you don't see the kids that I see every day and have every day since Henry started school. The kids I know and love. You know, the Olivia's, the Coles, <laughs> the Zoe's, the the Gracie's, the mm, the amazing kids that I know and love because they went to school with my son. You might not see them out in the world very much because it's hard. But hopefully, like I said, I'm optimistic that it will improve and that the future will, I hope, provide room for people like Henry to be able to be a part of it every day. Okay, and now it is time for I Didn't Sign Up For This. Here is another story I forgot about. Heavens. But we're going to go back to Henry's first birthday. And this also kind of fits, you know, doesn't kind of, it totally fits in with the topic of being out in public. He had for his first birthday, he had a classic Winnie the Pooh birthday party theme. Not Disney Winnie the Pooh, but classic Winnie the Pooh. Very soft. I got his cake at, um, at this time at our new Super Target even though it was baby poo rather than classic poo, because it still looked cute and it was in gold and not like metallic gold, but like gold, the color and sage green, not bright primary colors, but soft colors and babyish. Or it would have been. They're cake ladies on my list. I told them I would pick it up at noon. At noon, the party was at four. I got there at about 1140 and it wasn't done yet. Okay, cool. I, I was early. No big deal. So I ask how long she thinks it'll be so I can determine whether to kill time there or go run other errands and come back. And she says 20 minutes. Cool. I am there with my daughter and my eldest son and Henry. And okay, so it's the four of us. I, I went through the store to pick up my other items and being the ultra cool mom I am. I let the kids rampage through the toy section for 10, 10 minutes. Um, now, when I say rampage through the, the toy section, it's not at all what you think. Because I have the calmest rampaging children on earth. They would stare seriously at the toy as if to psychically ascertain its fun quotient and then point at it saying, Mommy, look! My eldest boy was the funniest. The way he would stare and the expression on his face, you would think he was doing some sort of physics equation. Anyway, 20 minutes comes and goes. So we wandered back over to the bakery. We expected the cake to be finished. You see, in my life, it's all about the misplaced optimism. Not only is it not done, it hasn't been started yet. She's still working on the Spider-Man cake she was working on before, which was shaped like a freaking building. And it was a nightmare from an architectural construction and a confectionery standpoint. I took a deep breath because I didn't want to be one of those horrible customers that, you know, retail workers always complain about by freaking out that my cake's not done. But I decide 
that rather than wander off again, I would wait there since it, you know, it couldn't be that much longer, right? Misplaced optimism. As she finished up the Spider-Man atrocity, some other mom came up, pulls a round cake out of the refrigerated bin, and hands it to the decorator saying, could you write happy birthday Timmy on that? Does the decorator later say, it'll be a few minutes, there's other customers waiting. Nope. She took the cake and does the writing, which, granted, only took like two minutes, but still. It's now ten minutes after twelve, and she hasn't started on our cake yet. I'm standing with Henry in a cart and daughter and eldest boy are growing increasingly bored and they're starting to wander around the area. They're asking for baked goods. And, you know, remember earlier when I talked about that you can sense that your time is running out? I was sensing something bad. My time was running out and there was something bad looming behind my eldest boy's eyes. So I just want my stupid poo cake so I can get the blazes out of there. Meanwhile, decorator lady who has my order form right next to her is asking what I wanted. Like I didn't come in four days ago and tell them so they could write it down so it would be there for you to look at. Chocolate cake, she asks. No, either yellow or white. I can't remember. It's on the form. Lemon filling, she asks. Yes, it's on the form. What do you want written? It's on the form! It's on the form! Read the form! Ah! Stabity stab stab with the form. Keep in mind, while all this is going on, the crowd around the bakery is getting larger with other people wanting to pick up their cakes and ask questions about cakes and smell the cakes and whatever. Another family came in to pick up the aforementioned Spidey Tart and is peeved about something. My daughter has begun slowly Grateful Dead spin dancing in place, singing some song about Jesus and Christmas. My eldest son has started an exploration of the cake fridge, poking at the different cakes and yelling at me about what they are. Then <laughs> he found a pre-made cake in a construction truck theme. And he at this time was nightmarishly obsessed with construction equipment. I am now officially screwed. He began freaking out about this cake and how we need this cake and eldest wants this cake with dump trucks. Literally, I must have said 567 billion times, it's not your birthday, it's Henry's birthday and he's having a Pooh Bear cake. No, dump truck cake. Oh, bloody hell. The decorator lady has now frosted the cake and it's time to decorate. Keep in mind, I chose this cake because of the lovely, soft, baby-like colors. She asked, can I do blue and green instead of yellow and green? After quickly surveying my rapidly melting down crew, I said, sure, okay. Now, I, again, misplaced optimism. I thought the colors would still be in soft, baby-like colors. As I watch, she pipes royal blue and lime green around the edges. She does royal blue airbrushing where it's supposed to be sage green. She does not do the alphabet block icing decoration shown in the picture I picked from. For crying out loud, the colors didn't even go together. It didn't look anything like the picture other than the shape. <sighs> I know, I know, first world problem. As this was happening, eldest boy decides that now is the time to climb into the cake fridge and remove the dump truck cake so it can be purchased. Literally, the boy was head first in the cake, feet off the floor, balancing on his belly while lifting a quarter sheet cake up and saying, Mommy did this cake! I am now faced with insisting the cake be done the way it's pictured and risk my progeny turning the bakery section into a Three Stooges reel, or taking the ugly thing as it is and getting the hell out of Dodge. 
Guess what I did? I put the fucking cake in the cart and I started leaving. At this point, eldest boy realizes that the cake is lacking construction trucks and proceeds to completely lose his shit. I cannot get him to understand that it's not his birthday. I can't get him to understand that he can have a construction truck cake for his birthday. I can't even get him to stand up. So, I pick him up around the waist with my left arm, push the cart with my right arm, and tell my daughter to come now. Hordes of well-wishers stand agog as this woman strides from the bakery to the checkout with a three-year-old screaming like I just kicked him in the face and not staring like, wow, what a great mom, like she's not standing up for his crap and she's just leaving. Nope. Staring like, what kind of loser mom would have a kid who does that? Please. Like y'all have never had a kid tantrum it up for you. Get that look off your face before I knock it off you. I won't beat my kid because I love him, but I don't give two shakes about you and my punching fist is itchy. Anyway, after a rather decibel ridden checkout, we went home. Oh, and the cake was ready at 1235. And that's I didn't sign up for this. 15 year ago edition oh my god (laughs) thank you for checking in again for episode number six i hope that you enjoyed it i hope you can laugh with my travails (laughs) because i sure can we'll talk to you next week have a great week pop on over to the facebook page join the group say hi all those things bye-bye now